that will be around the topic of migration and trafficking of athletes. Uh, and I hope to continue some of the debate that started in the other room a few hours ago. But first, we will have some presentations. We will have uh, five people presenting here. And the first one will be Sine Ago, who will talk under the headline, Does European Dual Career Policies Include migra Migrating Athletes? I'll leave the floor to Sine. Now it's on. Well, we hope the technique will work. Perfect. Okay, so what I tried to do um, was is to um, make a um, presentation that's not that directed towards an academic audience, but uh, rather uh, towards policymakers. And I'm not sure that there are so many policymakers here, but anyway, you probably, uh, we can discuss the issues here. So basically, uh, Jens told me to get to the point, and um, that's the reason why the title here is um, a, a rather rhetoric uh, question. Does European dual career policy include migrating athletes? And the point in this presentation is that no, I don't think there's enough attention to international athletes in the dual career policy. And I think there's a lot of interesting discussions to be uh, related to this. But first, I'll just provide you with a bit of background. Oops. So the, the topic that we are covering here is, of course, the increasing uh, migration of athletes. It's been um, described in the literature for quite some decades now, um, and it's been described in ways that often alert attention to the, the most famous uh, incidents of sport labor migration, namely male football migration. But Sport labor migration is taking place in a lot of different sport disciplines and it's taking place at different levels. We are not only talking about the very highest prestigious um, jobs in clubs like Barcelona and Arsenal, but we are also talking about second division jobs in uh, other countries. We're talking about female athletes as migrants and these are some of the case studies that I would bring forward today. What we have uh, already um, studied, and we are not the only ones, is the way in which uh, mobility in sport is something that is really sought after. We also heard that in the panel this morning. It's something that is really sought after, and it's, it's uh, part of a future culture of migration, as Christian alerted attention to this morning. What we've also found is that often you have quite high expectators, expectations as young athlete towards your career trajectory. It's an upward career trajectory. And you have high expectations about the options of ensuring socioeconomic mobility, having financial gains through your um, sporting career. But the reality, the ones who have studied sporting careers in lower divisions club like Martin Roderick have uh, described the sort of no numerous career insecurities. You can have injuries, you can have a uh, change of management, you can have a uh, contract uh, exp expiration and a lot of other things. So the, the reality of living a life as a professional footballer abroad is much more um, varied than the dream often goes. And this is not just something that is related to um, athletes who come from other countries into a professional career. 
is something that uh, we have been uh, that there had been political attention towards. So, in a number of particularly Western European countries, there's been this issue going on on giving dual career support to national athletes, meaning that the ones who use their youth uh, training and uh, competing in order to become professional athletes will have support to uh, uh, do an education or vocational training. They will have advice on the way in which they can possibly develop a career after the athletic career. These countries and the things that happened in these countries is something that the European Union is uh, conscious about and they are conscious about the broader problem in pro professional sport. So there have been dual career programs running. There are European Union guidelines and dual career, uh, careers of athletes and there's been a call for study on how different nation states um, ensure dual career support to athletes. What is remarkable about these uh, documents is that they talk about the way in which European athletes can get into education in other European member states. And they talk about cross-European education programs. But the case studies that I will show you is illustrate that the problem is much broader and there's a need also to uh, take attention to non-European athletes and the dual career issues for non-European athletes. So what I'm going to uh, present very shortly from you is uh, from our book on women's soccer and transnational migration. So the case is women's football migration. And as I already said, we know a lot of when we hear about sport labor migration in the media, it's male football migration often. <coughs> but there are also a lot of women footballers migrating. In fact, it's only about 20 countries where you can play as a professional footballer, meaning like about 30 or less than 30% of women foot footballers, the leading women footballers play abroad. So it's quite essential in order to um, develop a professional career to go abroad. And the discipline is also interesting in relation to the discussion here because they sort of sharpening some of the issues, some of the dilemmas that might be in engaging yourself in professional sport because there's very little opportunity of having financial gains in women's uh, soccer and there, there are also very little opportunity of re relocating into sport-related jobs. So the specific case study that I'm taking out is built on studies that we've done um, following, now I just used a very general term, African women footballers and their migration into Scandinavian football clubs. And what happens is that a lot of these players would be coming um, to play, for instance, in provincial cities up in the very north of Sweden where you can't get the Scandinavia players going because they would be closer to the bigger city and ensuring themselves an education and, by the way, being supported by the club and the national government in their dual career development. But some of these uh, African women footballers have come to play in Scandinavian clubs and I've interviewed um, several of them uh, and I've interviewed one player particularly um, uh, re continuously or five times over the last um, seven years and every time I've talked to her there's of course a big variety in the extent to which footballers are preoccupied with education or not. But it, is, it has come across for me as a very uh, crucial issue for this migrant. She talks about <coughs> her worries about not having education. And the first time that I interviewed her, the issue was to have to do language courses and the difficulty of learning the Danish language. Then there was the issue of not being able to enter education. She needed to enter upper secondary school or gymnasiums. 
uh, then there's the issue of <coughs> finding instead relevant vocational training. And later on, she tried, she found um, a course that she would like to do, but it was not possible for her. So that is something that has come across very strongly in the interviews with her. Um, she's not, as I said, she's of course not uh, the only case. There's a lot of uh, variety, and there's also some of the footballers saying that it may not be education that is essential. They alert attention to the specific African context where they come from, where there's a lot of unemployment of well-educating well-educated youth. So it is a complicated issue, but what comes across as something that is um, general for them is that a lot of these players postpone their career termination. They do try to invest in a career after sports in the terms of possibly investing in <coughs> houses and things, what they call small business at home. Thanks, Nico. Um, but on the other hand, they are challenged by the fact that in the, um, at the moment, where they don't have more, uh, where they don't have a contract anymore, they will lose their residencies and work permits. permits. Some of the, them try to, to play for uh, as long as they can uh, have the chance of um, applying for citizenship. But I generally have the impression that several of them are in a, what I would perhaps call a betwixt and between situation. Uh, particularly when it comes to deciding uh, or finding out how to relocate into the country of residence at the, m at the moment or uh, the country of origin or what kind of profession to pick up on or and how to ensure their future uh, career. They, so there's a number of issues that I thought could be relevant to raise for the European Union um, representative. First of all, that in, in the present document, it doesn't talk about the access to upper secondary education. It presumes that athletes would be interested in higher education. And that's simply not possible for a large number of uh, players who come from out outside of Europe. Not all, but uh, some in these cases. Also, there's an issue of finding relevant education and relevant vocational training there's lacking international courses, there's lacking transnational career advice, and then there something that also comes out um, in these interviews, and I might be a bit mother-centric here, is that a lot of the girls or women are considering what to do in uh, terms of building relationships, partnerships, or having partners and planning there are family issues. As Nico mentioned this morning, age, age fixing is often going on. So they will possi possibly say that they are in their 30s, but in reality they would be at least in 30s when they're in their um, uh, career playing as professional players. So I do think that there's um, interesting perspectives here things that we need to study more about the conditions of non-European athletes and um, what could be the possible models that could accommodate that dual career support could also be given to non-European athletes. And the last thing that I would just alert your attention to is that if you're more generally interested in sport and migration, we have an international network running so you can sign up for our newsletter. Thank you. Thank you, Sine, for an interesting perspective on the European migration situation and how we react to the non-European athletes who, who work here. 
the next presenter, um, where did I leave it? Um, where did I find it? Well, I can look up here. It's actually two presenters uh, who will be presenting under, under the same headline, Subjective Experiences of Aspiring Football Migrants in Western Central Africa. And I will leave the floor to Mark Han first. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, thank you to, to Play the Game for, for inviting us here. Um, my name is Mark Han. I'm from the University of Amsterdam. Um, I work in a project called Global Sport, um, together with a group of, uh, of researchers led by, by Nico Besnier, and we're working on sports and migration in a global context. Um, it's, uh, yeah, and I should mention it's uh, funded by, um, by an ERC grant. Um, so the title which, uh, which we've given our presentation today is, uh, well, Rethinking Trafficking, Subjective Experiences of uh, Prospective West African Football Migrants. Um, in recent years, uh, the trafficking of football players from Africa to the leagues in Europe, Asia and the Middle East uh, has emerged as a major, a major topic and a major problem within the sport. Um, according to reports that saturate the media and which generates uh, a lot of anxiety, um, young players are lured by unscrupulous agents and middlemen um, from their homes in Africa by false promises of um, trials with big European clubs, um, contracts, and so on. Um, families are tricked into investing their life savings or taking out loans um, or even selling their property in order to raise money, um, which goes straight into the pockets of these corrupt agents. Um, the players themselves are then often abandoned in Europe, in an unknown country. Um, they're left to fend for themselves, and they face a precarious existence with, uh, without employment, documentation, um, without networks to rely on. Um, so this scenario, or some variant of this, uh, has become the dominant narrative in media reporting on trafficking in football. Um, and so, so while the exploitation of young African football players is a, is a, is a huge problem and a very serious problem um, and may actually take place in exactly the way I just described it, um, we believe that the reality and well, our, our research has shown that the reality is actually uh, much more complex than this. Um, so in this uh, presentation we're going to draw upon uh, long-term ethnographic fieldwork uh, among young athletes in, in West Africa, in my case, uh, in order to complicate the picture of trafficking. And, um, and in doing so, we, of course, really underline the importance of protecting athletes against trafficking and against exploitation. And, I mean, we really, uh, yeah, I, we really kind of recognize the importance of, uh, of organizations such as uh, Food Solidaire, who, were, who presented earlier this morning. Um, but we will also demonstrate that what is described as trafficking is uh, embedded in a complex matrix of family relations, economic conditions, and cultural expectations. Um, and I kind of follow on from, um, from what Nico was saying this morning, that, um, that um, athletes are embedded in these structures of kinship, reciprocity, um, and these are often, uh, in fact, ignored in academic and media perspectives. Um, just a short, a short note on my fieldwork. Um, I spent 12 months living in Dakar in Senegal, um, conducting uh, ethnographic research among young athletes, uh, agents, coaches, uh, and so, uh, families, and so on, um, and yeah, various other people involved in sports, so agents, um, uh, managers, etc. Uh, my focus was on the two dominant sports in Senegal, um, one of which is, um, is uh, Senegalese wrestling, as you can see, which is kind of very, very exciting and very interesting, but I'm not going to talk about it today because we're talking about uh, migration. So um, my focus will be on the other part of my fieldwork, which was on, um, on football. Um, so, so during my fieldwork, I visited football centers, academies, uh, football schools. I went to training sessions and matches. Um, I hung out with these football players um, in, uh, you know, both at training, in their homes, with their families, you know, going to, to clubs and so on. 
Um, so, yeah, I, con I conducted um, semi-structured interviews, but also, um, well, most of my field work is just based on ha uh, hanging out, which is what anthropologists do. We just hang out with people. Um, the, uh, the, the mainstream narrative in which uh, unsuspecting young football players are preyed upon uh, by, by these corrupt agents um, neglects a number of important factors. Um, for one thing, it, it portrays players as helpless victims. Um, but in my experience, in fact, these prospective uh, football migrants are very aware of the potential risks and the, uh, the, the negative consequences of migration. Um, the, in, in Dakar, in the football scene, there are a lot of stories circulating about, you know, would-be football players who are tricked out of their money. Um, and, and um, yeah, so, so these, these stories are shared. People, people are very aware of this. Um, I mean, of course, this doesn't prevent players, uh, young men, from, uh, you know, from losing their money and from, you know, being too eager to, to have a career. And, of course, I mean, it, it can still happen that people will, will fall prey to these very suspect agents. Um, but the fact that, you know, this, uh, the, the availability of information about, uh, you know, about the dangers of migration, in fact, um, it kind of complicates this, this narrative um, of if young football players being unaware or kind of being victims who are, who are ignorant of uh, these problems. Um, and, in fact, in, in these development centers, football clubs um, and academies, um, all of these players, um, they're, they're guaranteed to know other players who have already migrated. And so they're, they're in touch with these people on a regular basis. Uh, these are their, you know, their friends, their former teammates. So they talk on Facebook, uh, WhatsApp, uh, Skype, and so on. So they're in constant contact with players who have migrated to Europe, uh, North America, Asia. And so they, you know, they have a pretty good idea of what's going on. Um, and in fact, these players in Senegal, they use these international contacts to establish relationships with, with agents, with intermediaries, with coaches who can help them arrange the necessary documents uh, in order to move abroad. So players are very well informed about uh, the process of migration uh, in, in my fieldwork case, I have to stress. So this is in, uh, yeah, in urban Senegal, in Dakar. Um, and they are aware of the risks, yet they actively seek to migrate. So uh, the question which, um, which, uh, which I'm asking is, you know, are, they, uh, you know, are they willing participants in their own exploitation, uh, in their own trafficking, or should we kind of consider them to be entrepreneurs who take a calculated risk in an attempt to achieve success in football? Um, and just as a side note, it's interesting that in, in local discourse, um, so in conversations you know, with, uh, with these uh, football players, with people in the football scene in Dakar, um, the terms such as exploitation, trafficking, or their French equivalents uh, are in fact not used among players. So people talk about migration uh, and about you know, going abroad, but no one talks about trafficking in, in Dakar. Um, in addition to this, uh, ideas about trafficking and exploitation generally seem to work on the assumption that African football structure is very disorganized. Um, it's uh, you know, chaos where these, uh, these kind of uh, uh, these unscrupulous agents can operate at will and they can swoop in and um, you know, trick these players. Um, and of course, the, the structures of, uh, of football in Senegal are not comparable to those in Europe, but there is nonetheless a, a very clear hierarchy of clubs and academies. Um, the football landscape is organized to the extent that, that a number of academies and clubs are known to be legitimate platforms for football migration. Um, and you know these are these are clubs with very or clubs or academies with very modern uh, training facilities and with you know very professional um, management and so on, and this is of course where um, where the best players generally end up, and the players who bypass these academies or who who are unable to to get into these academies, um, you know they they um, yeah they they're, they're aware that they're that they're in. Um, yeah, that they're, they're not within, within this professional environment. Um, and they're very conscious of that fact. And so that suggests to me that, in fact, the priority of a number of these young football players is not necessarily a football career, but in many cases, migration at all cost. Um, and that brings me on to my next point. Um, oh, I've left this photo on for a long time, so I'll just show you a, another photo. I don't have a presentation, just uh, some nice pictures. Um, so, so discourses of trafficking and exploitation assume that, uh, that young, f young football players who have not managed to achieve success abroad, uh, in fact, need to be rescued 
and brought back to their families in Africa. Um, and uh, in many cases, I believe this to be true. Um, but this view, this general idea that young players are better off at home, um, and I'm, I'm quoting directly from a paper by, uh, by um, Essen, 2014, um, this idea that they're better off at home does not always hold up. Um, so many young men see football as a means to an end, and that end being migration to Europe. So um, th this morning we actually heard about, um, about a case in which a number of Liberian players were trafficked to Laos, um, where they were housed in very poor conditions, they weren't paid properly, um, they were treated very badly. And even in, this, you know, in these terrible circumstances, I mean, in a country such as Laos, which is a long way away from, uh, you know, from their dream of a European league. So even here, um, for af after FIFA and FIFA Pro intervened, um, a number of the players actually chose to remain in Laos rather than to, to, to go back to Liberia, um, which, is, which, which is actually very surprising. If that's the response of players who have been tra uh, trafficked to Laos, then what about the players who go to Europe? Um, I would suggest that the line between football migration and um, economic migration in a more general sense is very blurred. Uh, it's very hard to, to distinguish clearly between the two. Uh, and although football may, may often be plan A, uh, the, the goal is actually, in many cases, simply to migrate. Um, and in, in Senegal and many other West African countries, uh, there are very limited employment opportunities for young men. Um, and uh, we often talk about um, young men being trapped in a state of prolonged adolescence um, where they're unable to grow up, they're unable to become, uh, to, to, you know, to get jobs, to get married, to become fathers, and to fulfill their traditional male role as uh, providers. And this causes a sense of shame, uh, inadequacy. Uh, and in this context, the, 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 the transnational migrant, um, the migrant in general, so not just the, the football player, but the migrant uh, has emerged as an archetype of success. And even though these migrants live in Europe, uh, evidence of their, their wealth can be seen in all over Dakar in the form of new, very large houses, uh, modern houses. Uh, maybe I can, uh, yeah, I mean, well, you can see it a little bit in the background. This is the street where I lived. Um, and yeah, so, so migration is really seen to be, uh, to be a solution for young men to, you know, to this kind of crisis of masculinity. Uh, and I'm just going to, going to now give you two examples of uh, two of the players who, who I got to know in, in Dakar. Uh, Pap is a young football player who trains at a, quite a notable academy which has produced uh, several migrant players uh, and which regularly train, they regularly train and they play games uh, on, you know, under the gaze of European agents. Um, and so, you know, th this is a very this is a serious academy uh, with a real prospect of migrating. Uh, despite, despite this, Pap, he feels that time is running out for him and he has to take things into his own hands. So he has himself, um, he's arranged a trial with a French third division team which is managed by, by a coach who he knows from, from Senegal. And the coach can arrange the necessary papers and Pap has to contribute the money himself. And when, when, when he told me this, I was very suspicious. Uh, uh, you know, I was asked for money actually um, for this and I was, you know, I was very kind of wary of these, uh, these schemes, these scams. Um, but then, um, well, Pap, he said he, he, he knows this man, he trusts this man, and, but he's also aware of the risks. And so, he, uh, so what Pap did, he called one of his uh, friends, who's a football player in France, and asked him to meet with, um, with this coach from the French third division club. And upon assuring himself that this was somehow a legitimate story, uh, Pap uh, he then went about raising the money uh, which he needed to pay for flights and for his passport. And here he, he was very reliant on his family and his networks, especially those in Europe. Um, I asked Pap, you know, what will he do if he isn't offered a contract? Uh, I mean, will he fly back after the trial? Uh, and he says, well, you know, he's already thought about this, um, and he has a plan B, of course. Uh, he's going to stay with his friend, and he's going to find a job, um, you know, working on uh, Ill illegally, let's say. Uh, and he's, he's aware, he's, he has weighed up the risks, uh, these are his words, and he knows it will be tough, but he, he thinks his destiny is in Europe and not in Senegal, and he's just absolutely sure about that. Um, and now, now I'll briefly um, talk about another player, Amadou, um, who is a, m a, a very, uh, very talented young midfield player from, um, from quite a poor remote area outside Dakar. Um, and he, he was in one of these elite academies, um, but uh, he dropped out as, as his family could no longer afford transport. 
and desperate for his son to play abroad, um, Amadou's father sold his house in order to pay an agent to take him to Morocco. Um, there's, no, there's no contract on offer, it's just a vague, vague talk of a trial. Um, and this took place around 10 months ago. Today, Amadou is living in Casablanca. He's outstayed his visa, and he's still looking for a club. And I talk to him often. I mean, he's, he's in a very difficult situation, but he has no desire to return right home to Senegal. He wants to stay there. Um, okay, and in bo both of these cases, we, saw that we see the important role of um, family networks in football migration. So Pap uh, solicited the help of his family and his uh, friendship links in order to raise the funds and to gain the information which he needed to travel to France. Um, and he's also counting on the help of his family and friends in France uh, once, he, once he gets there, whether or not he manages to, to have a professional career. Um, in Amadou's case, uh, we see that football migration is in fact a uh, collective process. So Amadou's father has identified Amadou as uh, the family's savior, who will eventually bring financial stability to the family. And uh, in fact, Amadou, ref he receives preferential treatment from his parents um, um, compared to his siblings. So he has his own room, he has a laptop, he has new football boots. And so of course he's under a lot of pressure and failure is not an option. Um, just to briefly conclude, uh, because time's running out, um, yeah, the question which, which I want to pose is, you know, what exactly are we talking about when, when we talk about exploitation and trafficking? Um, in a context where becoming a successful man is so inextricably linked to migration, uh, it's very difficult to, to draw the line between exploitation and entrepreneurship, uh, and between trafficking and calculated risk. Um, and while it's very important to protect and to inform these vulnerable young men, um, I suggest that we have to place the exploitation of African football players within a broader um, family and social context. Uh, and now I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Urosh, who will um, tell us about some similar things in Cameroon. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> well placed. Another perspective on what trafficking really is to those who live there and those who choose uh, to go for a career, uh, perhaps in Europe. Uh, you'll be using the rest of the presentation, or is it enough? Okay, perfect. <laughs> then I'll leave the floor to, and I'm not sure if I pronounced it correct, Uros Kovac? That's perfect. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, so uh, I will not spend too much time on introductions, bec because, I mean, this is actually a joint presentation. And uh, Mark has already done a, a very good introduction, and uh, I will try not to lose too much time on that. Um, uh, instead, I will try to show a few ethnographic examples. Um, first of all, pictures. Um, uh, so uh, I will be focusing on two, on two major topics in this presentation. Uh, one is the football players from Cameroon, aspiring young football players um, uh, in the southwest of Cameroon. Uh, with whom I spent about 12, uh, 12 months uh, in my ethnographic fieldwork, um, and about their families, uh, so uh, about their um, uh, about their relatives, about their parents, uh, children, um, uh, and basically about the expectations that their families and relatives have from them. Um, so let me introduce my fieldwork first. Um, uh, the fieldwork was in Cameroon among aspiring football players. Uh, they were generally in their early to mid-20s. Uh, they have all played football since uh, early childhood, uh, and that is quite common for Cameroonian boys. Um, as children, some of them might have gone through structured training programs in a football academy, uh, but practically all of them played casual football on the muddy fields uh, around their schools. Uh, all of the players that I have worked with are actively training football uh, in one of many official or semi-official football academies or clubs. Um, they're usually competing in a regional league. Uh, at some of them have also experience maybe in the first division. Some of them even have some experience in the, in the youth national teams. Um, usually, most of the time, they're not compensated at all uh, for, for their playing in any of the clubs. Um, they're only maybe at times provided food and, and some basic shelter. Um, not, uh, not all of the footballers that I work with are uh, hail, hail from a poor background. Uh, or let me say not all, the, all of the aspiring football players in Cameroon 
come from a poor background, but the ones that I work with actually, actually mostly do. Um, that would mean that uh, they, would str they struggle to pay rent. Uh, that would mean that um, uh, they, uh, they uh, count uh, and collect their money uh, very carefully in order to pay, for example, tuition fees, school fees uh, of their children. Uh, and often they have troubles uh, collecting money from their relatives and they're forced to collect money from their relatives in order to pay, for example, uh, 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 malaria drugs. Uh, drugs, uh, yeah, against malaria. Um, uh, the, the among, uh, among young men in general in Cameroon, uh, the football players are an extreme case of fixation on migration. Uh, practically every uh, aspiring footballer in Cameroon is convinced that playing out of the country is the only way of achieving any level of success in football. They have clear ideas that uh, in what they call white man country in Europe, uh, success is based on merit. Uh, that is uh, hard work and good performance which will bring them to a higher level. Um, they contrast this, uh, this view with the image that they see in their home country where according to them and in their view, having personal connections and financial support uh, used to bribe people in influential places uh, such as club presidents and managers uh, is the only way to achieve some success. So instead of that, Europe um, in their eyes uh, is a place full of opportunities for their talent and their hard work to be recognized and rewarded. Uh, the trajectory of the young men uh, determined to make a football career is definitely pointed towards the global north but it is by no means a clear and a simple path. Uh, a player moving directly from Cameroon to signing a contract in one of the highly revered clubs in Western Europe is very much an exception. Um, most of the players that I worked with have a, a much more precarious career path that takes them to the margins of the global football industry, such as lower division clubs in Eastern European countries. Uh, for example, uh, one of the players that I worked with uh, was sent to a fourth division club in an uh, East European country that is not particularly famous for football. Mm, as he was pre pre preparing for the trip, he was quite mm, oblivious. He had no idea actually where he was going. He, he, ha he was oblivious of his destination. It was only until the last moment. Mm, he had very little idea in which country he's actually going to go to. Um, when he arrived to the club, he was stricken by the bad conditions that he encountered there. <laughs> Um, like all the foreign players in that particular club, he was housed in a, in a downtrodden house and he had to find a way to feed and sustain himself. Um, uh, and also while the local players uh, in that club were paid a certain stipend, uh, none of the foreign players, including himself, were paid a single euro. Uh, as one would imagine, this was not the ideal scenario for him nor it was anywhere near the fulfillment of his childhood dream of playing professional football and earning an income to do so, uh, doing so. Uh, however, while complaining about the bad conditions in his destination, he saw this trip as a good uh, and necessary springboard for his career. Um, after his trip to this uh, fourth division club, um, I started collecting reactions of his teammates uh, in the Cameroonian football club that he left behind. Uh, and I was stricken by the amount of celebratory words that he was uh, being showered with. Uh, among his former teammates, uh, he was seen as a prime case of success. Uh, when I confronted them with the facts of the deplorable conditions uh, that their friend was in, uh, they explained to me that this was a necessary step in one's career. Uh, personal sacrifice and suffering was for them a part of the deal. Uh, in their eyes, their friend abroad was in a good position because he could now use the low-level club as a, as a springboard for his career, as I said before. Um, at the very least, he was outside of Cameroon, uh, where in the player's eyes, uh, I mean outside, he would have more opportunities to sign professional contracts. Um, I was also surprised to hear that most players preparing to travel do not actually expect to start earning money right away as soon as they, uh, they travel. Instead, they see traveling abroad to lower, lower level club as an opportunity to, to develop their skills uh, in Europe, uh, to have more opportunities for being spotted by an agent, and to signing professional contracts abroad and eventually starting to earn some money. Um, now, to go back to, to another topic, uh, which is uh, family expectations. Uh, 
so as my colleague already pointed out, it is very important that we embed these people in social contexts uh, from which they come from. So uh, to, uh, uh, to analyze their behavior in relation to the social relations uh, that are significant to them. Uh, in this case, uh, family, no? relatives uh, and, and parents. Uh, widely generalized, uh, Cameroonian parents are extremely reluctant to allow their children to pursue football as a career. Uh, for most of them, football is the activity of the street. Uh, they argue quite reasonably that playing football distracts children from going to school and from uh, following a path uh, of uh, education. Um, Cameroonian footballers, especially the older ones, uh, have many stories about their parents uh, uh, beating them after they would return from the football field. Uh, one of the reasons for this is that uh, Cameroonian parents look at the bad financial state of football in Cameroon and quite reasonably they do not believe that their children will be able to provide livelihood for themselves uh, and, and for them, no? for, their, uh, for their parents. Uh, however, as of recent, um, this attitude uh, of parents are starting to change. Uh, they are starting to become more open to the idea of their kids having a football career. Uh, superstar players like Samuel Eto have shown that there is money in football. Uh, and while some parents and relatives are still reluctant to fully support their children to follow the path of football, more of them are starting to support them after seeing some initial results. Um, if the child shows a particular level of dedication and talent, and if his coach and the club manager are reporting certain progress, many families will consider the child as a potential provider for the whole family and will invest serious amounts of money into the child's, or by maybe by this time, young man's uh, development in football. Uh, this time, however, all of their attention will be turned outwards to Europe and to the global north. Uh, for example, I spoke to an elder sister uh, and, uh, and an elder brother of one of my informants, a uh, young football player who was uh, at the time traveling to another East European country trying to find a, a club. Um, the brother and sister told me that even though they have not been supportive of the young man's football career earlier, uh, they have eventually invested 450,000 Central African francs, which translates to about 700 euros, which is uh, quite a significant, uh, significant amount in the context of Cameroon. Uh, the money was allotted to covering part of his uh, traveling expenses, so visa, visa application, and the plane ticket. Um, um, and uh, this is, uh, so the players and the elder brother uh, and the sister, they did not think of this as an outrageous request from the manager. Uh, instead, they were extremely happy that a manager had connections in Europe uh, and was able to take their younger brother out of Cameroon. Um, I'm running out of time, so I will, I will um, let me go to another example, maybe a better one. Um, uh, at some point, I developed a deep friendship with one of my informants, who was a footballer, uh, and who was identified by many as an extraordinarily talented footballer. Uh, he uh, also traveled to an East European country in an, in an attempt to make a career. Uh, however, this did not work and he returned to Cameroon where he has been residing with his parents for a bit more than a year. On several occasions, I was summoned by his father for a serious conversation. After explaining to me that he invested 1,000 euros in his son's plane ticket and visa application, he instructed me to speak with his son, well, my friend, in order to make him understand that he needs to do everything in his power to move out of the country. So the father was extremely disturbed by the fact that his son was so talented but instead of playing international football and supporting his family through it, he's playing football locally. He complained to me that he is extremely unhappy and uncomfortable of having his talented son still living in the family house instead of being on his way of building his own house. Even playing in the Cameroonian first division was not acceptable for the father of the player. Uh, he was not convinced that this would be enough to support the, the growing family. And from his point of view, Europe was the only way out. Uh, just a quick conclusion. Um, so we are not, uh, uh, so my colleague and I, and in general the, the Global Sport Group, we're not arguing that there is no uh, trafficking in football. We're not arguing there is no exploitation in the football industry. There is, uh, and there is a huge amount of evidence for it, uh, and it is systemic. We are only saying that, uh, that we need to complicate this picture in order to understand it better. 
uh, rather than being helpless victims of predatory European agents, we, we propose that the actions of young African players are often entrepreneurial in that they follow specific economic agendas involving calculated risk, risk taking. Moreover, the young men uh, are not isolated individuals making decisions only by and for themselves, but are deeply embedded in structures of family and kinship, which translate to complex sets of opportunities and expectations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, really good uh, timekeeping. So we have time for both the last two presentations and some discussions and debate afterwards. So the next person to speak to us is Christian Ungru. Oh, how do you pronounce your last name? <laughs> no, that was okay, Ungru, um, who will speak um, under, under the, the headline playing the other African footballers, racism and self size How do you say that? Charism Charismatization um, uh, of German football, um, professional football. Yeah. I'll leave the floor to you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. And just a week ago, football commentator and former Italian international Stefano Iranio got sucked by Swiss TV a station RSI after criticizing an error from the Roma defender and black German international Antonio Rüdiger during the 4-4 draw in the Champions League against Bayer Leverkusen. Following Rüdiger's failed attempt to play the offside trap, which caused Leverkusen's second goal, Iranio said, black players in the defensive line often make these mistakes because they are not concentrated. They are powerful physically, but when it is time to think, they often make this time type of error. Well, today such a statement causes, causes massive critique in the media and leads to severe consequences for the commentator, whether in Switzerland, Germany or else. This, is a, this has not always been the case. Um, in his homeland Germany, for example, Rüdiger would have faced such a critique raised by Iranio time and again if he had been a player during the 1990s. Probably he would have been the victim of open racist insults in stadiums like many other black players at this time. The good news is that open racism in uh, professional German football has declined over the last 10 to 15 years, uh, not least due to enhanced official measures against racist tendencies and the differentiation of the fan scene. Even more, African footballers in the Bundesliga are frequently celebrated by fans and are often icons of the clubs. However, and this is the bad news, this celebration and the general image of professional African footballers continue to socially construct them as being different from other, usually white players, and this difference grounds in alleged natural features that reproduce racial classifications. Thus, Iranian statement is not such an exception as it might seem in the first place. Well, despite being allegedly powerful but not very smart players, African footballers have the image of being trick-loving, playful, and immature. Well, where do these images come from, and why continues the notion of the African other to be so influential, even though open, racis open racism <coughs> has apparently declined in German professional football over the last years? Well, in order to answer these questions, we firstly need to look briefly at the history of football in Africa and how the image of a specific African style of play emerged before I elaborate on discrimination and admiration and finally identify also the advantages of playing the other for, for black players themselves. From the 1920s onwards, football was used by colonial administrators and Christian missionaries as a means of disciplining the local male population in African colonies that was widely regarded as foolish and lazy, but also powerful and therefore threatening. It was used to, as a way to instill qualities such as self-control, team spirit, and submissive, submissive, submissiveness to colonial authorities. Well, on the other hand, playing football was also a means for young African men to gain prestige and to negotiate social status among local people 
particularly by showing individual uh, skills such as strength, improvisation, and dribbling, a counter model to colonial intentions. Well, during the growing struggle for independence in the mid 20th century, this counter model symbolized a creative resistance against repression, apartheid, and colonialism. And from the 1960s onwards, football became an engine of political endeavors to create national unity in the continent's many young and ethnically heterogeneous states. In many African countries, government support helped to make football a vehicle of emancipation from colonial values, and the emphasis laid on intelligence and technique on the pitch underlined the ex explicit attempt of a countermodel to the colonial idea of a natural, powerful, but unsophisticated African. Well, how successful was the struggle to overcome colonial ascriptions in the African context? It seems that both the emphasis on technique as a countermodel to colonial values, as well as the colonial image of Africans as playful, wild, and unsophisticated, have contributed to the current notion of African football as trick-loving, powerful, and immature. Across all borders, and regardless of how individual national teams perform, reports on football in Africa reg re um, regularly romanticize it as childish and, childish and unspoiled, qualities, qualities which um, distinguish it from professional European football. And especially coaches and football officials use this explanatory model. And I quote, um, African players exhibit so much playfulness and so much ple pleasure in the game, or Africa is a gold mine of love of the ball, elegance, and passion for playing. These are frequent statements of uh, many European coaches who admire the su supposedly natural African talent for football. Well, however, <coughs> however, in order to attain success, African players need to mature and learn discipline as for example, Rudi Gutendorf and Bertie Fuchs, um, well-known German coach, coaches who have both worked in Africa believe, and I quote, if African players were less in love with the ball and had a bit, of, had a bit more understanding of modern tactics, African national teams could be on a level with Brazil or European teams, they claim. Well, it's by statements like these the popular notion of the powerful, trick-loving, but immature African sportsman has become a widespread image among coaches, fans, players, and the media. In Germany, ethnic ascriptions like this have widely become shared social knowledge. Well, what does it mean? This widespread image creates an expectation on the part of the observer that players will behave accordingly. For instance, if a Cameroonian outdribbles two opponents within a small space, or if a black German makes a tactical mistake, these actions will often be interpreti interpreted with reference to existing ethnic knowledge, which ascribe to these players an enjoyment of the game, or, respectively, an unsophisticated and immature style of play. Thereby, certain actions of African footballers on the pitch are explained by referring to the stock of social knowledge of alleg alleged African attributes. When these ethnic ascriptions then seem to be continuously verified, the social knowledge reproduces itself and adds to the power of such ascriptions. Well, however, these ethnic ascriptions gain also their, their power from another side, namely black players themselves. It is quite striking, for example, that African or black players in Germany also see elaborate ball skills and the lack of discipline and tactical understanding as the main difference between African and German football. When a former professional footballer from West Africa, looking back on his professional career in Germany between 2000 and 2010 says, and I quote, I've learned a lot here, tactics, discipline. While in Africa, it is the fun of the game that is important. He's representative of a whole generation of African footballers in Germany. Gerald Asamoa, a former black German international born in Ghana, underlines this, and I quote again, African players lack discipline, systematic order, and seriousness. I myself have learned this not before being in Germany. Well, nevertheless, it is important to African players that they should be perceived as African, or that they should not completely give up their mentality. Thus, Andrew Sinkala, 
a former Zambian international you know, who played in the Bundesliga for many years, actually between the late 90s and 2010, says, and I quote again, when you come to Germany, you lose a bit of your culture, but you will always play your football, and for instance, when you get the ball, you will dance with the ball a bit. The fans see and say, okay, he has to do that what he did in Africa, but this is not German football, and this is not the mentality of the Germans. So now one could argue that players from Africa and Europe just play different styles because of different attitudes towards the game. However, ethnic ascriptions go beyond that. In the world of football, black players, regardless of their place of origin or place of soci socialization, are generally believed to have a better technique but less tactical understanding than white players. Thus, supposed differences in ball skills or discipline between players of different skin color are explained, are explained by their genetic constitutions and not, for instance, by specific training. Self-representations of black German players, like the one of a current striker of a German third division club who moved to Germany at the age of six, underlines this. And I quote again, I think you can tell that someone is an African footballer. I can't really say why, but I think there is a difference in the way Africans and Europeans handle the ball. Even Africans like me who have grown up here have some special characteristics. It's something that can't be denied, no matter whether you learned to play in Africa or here in Europe. And even the 33-year-old uh, uh, was taught everything he knows about football in junior teams of a Bundesliga club. He des describes himself and his way of playing football as African which, in view of the fact that, that he grew up in um, Germany and is socialized, socialized, sorry, he was socialized in football um, all his life in Germany, this can only be ascribed to natural talent and not to acquired skills. And this is quite striking. So why do black players share the view of being naturally different from white footballers? Or in other words, why do they play the other? Well, also, ascriptions of being immature and undisciplined downgrade black players. They use the idea of a distinct African style as ethnic self-charismatization. Ascription, ascriptions of being playful, trick-loving, elegant or powerful are certainly much admired assets. African players serve and share this stereotype of a specific African style, not least in order to meet German expectations and thus to be accepted. This may be a rather implicit process, but what is important is not whether a black player is really in love with the ball or not, but that he shares this knowledge and is able to describe match situations which could be interpreted differently in the same way as fans, coaches, and players in Germany. And this by referring to a natural African or alleged natural African playing style. This process of self-charismatization of a black player as African may be segregated and is carried away from actual abilities of the player. However, it often promises sporting success, success and contribute to a distingui distin distinguished position as a celebrated star and as an advertisement of a club. However, the notion of being playful, trick-loving or powerful comes with other descriptions of being naive, immature and wild. It is this combination of images that reveal the dominant discourse of colonial ascription and post-colonial counter models of what was and is perceived to be generally African. By implicitly referring to a colonial worldview, even ascriptions of successful black players, uh, sorry, by implicitly referring to a colonial worldview, even the appreciation of successful black players is often influenced by a general image of the continent that implies a natural backwardness. In this respect, the cheering of a star player is an expression for the joy over alleged African characteristics, as, as well as forms of open racism in the stadium, are often only two extremes of a con continuum, the manifestation of an apparent African otherness. And this is very well displayed by Stefano Rani himself, who, after the, his dismissal, felt misunderstood and intended to defend himself by saying, Rudiger read the situation badly because black players are not accustomed to paying attention to certain details. If they were as detailed orientated as us, 
Then they dom dominate the spot because they have everything in terms of strength and technique. End of quote. And just by the way, Rüdiger was born and raised in Germany and has ever played in Europe. So you can imagine how far Iranius' defense gets. So to conclude, what is most disturbing in the realm of those worldviews and also their white black acknowledgement by black players' self charismatization is the manifest manifestation of a natural African other also beyond the social field of football. In German professional football, forms of open racism may, ha may have declined. However, colonial rhetoric and implicit racist-oriented worldviews have still a prominent stage in the most popular sport of the country. That may set the image and discourses of what Africa is all about in general. Immature, threatening, and on a lower evolutionary level as a whole. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. And we'll move quickly to our last speaker in this session. I will welcome Martin Kainz, who will speak on the, the theme, <coughs> the operating and embedment of European football academies in West Africa using the example of Red Bull Ghana. The floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Thanks for introducing. Hello, everybody. First of all, I have to apologize or I want to apologize for uh, my level of English. I think it's the first, yeah, it is definitely the first time for me speaking in English. Normally, I'm used to German. So, yeah, um, let's see how this goes. In comparison to uh, the other speakers, uh, Sine, Christian, Urwosch, and Mark, um, I'm not focusing on the player, but um, I'm focusing on an institution um, that enables migration. I'm focusing on Red Bull Ghana. And Red Bull Ghana is uh, led by all the, no, uh, above Red Bull Ghana, there's a transnational uh, global company. This company, as well as Red Bull Ghana, is led by Europeans. And those Europeans are seeking to benefit from African talent. And on this topic, I wrote two master theses, um, also one book driven by the simple motivation to find out um, the actual aim of Red Bull Ghana. So I always ask myself in advance, why is Red Bull expanding to Ghana? Why do, are they establishing a football academy in Ghana? And I just wanted to find out um, if they are really as good as they pretend to be um, on the websites, on the, um, in the press, and so on. And first of all, I'm going to give you um, a short uh, overview of my presentation. So I'm going to talk about the background of Red Bull investing into football, about the aims of Red Bull Ghana, about my results um, that are based on a stay of about two months in, in Ghana, um, outside and inside of the academy, the conclusions, obviously, and the potentials and the status quo. So um, Red Bull is uh, known as a global marketing company founded in 1984 um, with a head office in Salzburg. The main product is the can and the main uh, marketing strategy is based on extreme sports, Formula One and so on. And in 2005, um, they decided to invest into football. Um, first of all, they founded Red Bull Salzburg, then a team in New York, a team in Leipzig, and they also established two academies, one in Brazil and one in Ghana. So um, the overall objective is obviously getting active in the football business and increasing the global um, value, um, the picture, the uh, reputation of, of, of the brand. Now let's make a short um, excursion to Ghana. Um, we are here in Accra um, taking a car that um, needs four hours to go to the Volta River, um, east direction, direction of Togo. Um, just at the Volta River, there's Sogakope, a city of 7,000 inhabitants. 
And in Sogokope, there is one road that we have to take uh, to the Academy of Red Bull Ghana. Uh, it takes us 20 more minutes uh, where we are passing uh, Fivier, a town led by a chief, so functioning uh, in, in traditional law, not in state law, not in modern law, but with chiefs and stool fathers. Here is the pitch of Fievier. They are playing in the fourth uh, national league. And here is Bochi, also um, with a chief and about 15 inhabitants. And I'm, um, I'm telling this because Bochi and Fievier, those, uh, those villages where chiefs are the, the local authorities, they are usually the landowners, and the same is the case at the Red Bull Academy. So Le Red Bull just had a tenure, but not an ownership. And um, behind Fuji, you can see the, the tribune of the Red Bull Academy, which looks like this from the inside. So the question is, uh, why Ghana and what are the aims? According to an official of Red Bull Ghana, an Austrian, um, the aims are New York is about marketing, Leipzig and Salzburg is a combination of marketing and sports. Here in Ghana, it's only about sport. In Ghana, you can't sell a Red Bull can. That has nothing to do with marketing. It has to do with the fact that Africa is cheap and that you can find a lot of talent here. It's about developing players for Leipzig, Salzburg and New York or about selling players. So the aim is obviously finding players for Red Bull teams, New York, Leipzig, and Salzburg, but also, and this was not stated by the official, by passing the FIFA under 18 rule. Um, just like academies, European academies, are going uh, to African countries in order to find uh, talented players as soon as possible, as Red Bull did at the age of 10 or 11. Olders were not interesting anymore. Um, to train them, to inject them their own philosophy and more or less to, to educate them the way they want them to be and then at the age of 18 to transfer them um, to the mother club. Um, this is some more pictures at the uh, top left side you have the school complex, at the right side you have the IT room, um, no, okay, top and at the bottom left side you have one of five pitches and at the right side, the leisure area. So it is clear um, that um, Red Bull um, built a state-of-the-art academy, not very cheap, 5.5 million euros, and uh, 100,000 100, euros per month. Um, they also um, had many personnel on the contract, also lots of expertise from Europe, like managers, sport directors, um, head, co head coach, and also the head scout, head of scouting, that's the name. Well, and what they got were, was four teams, one under 13, one under 15, under 17, and the first team, it's more like an under 21 team playing in the second highest division in Ghana, and about, m yeah, more than 100 players, um, but um, as they said, they tested more than thousands within the academy. And those tests were not just one day, but merely, well, one week up to one month. So um, the, the, ideal or, yeah, the ideal way of a player um, from Red Bull Ghana would have been that he gets um, discovered in a juvenile team. So Red Bull had a broad network of scouts and farm teams and physical education trainers searching for talents all around Ghana, but also around West Africa. Um, then after medical checks, checks of the character, um, checks of the real age and the expected hate, um, they are getting contracted, um, playing for Red Bull under 13, then under 15, under 17 first, and at the age of 18 going to Salzburg. Starting with under 18 with the aim to get to um, Red Bull Salzburg, uh, which actually up to now one player um, could realize. Um, another
problem of Red Bull was that they had many obstacles and challenges I suppose they didn't experience. Um, there were two uh, main levels of, of actors, so actors uh, within the national local football business like the Ghanaian FA, the Ghanaian Clubs Association, Ghanaian Players Union, but also scouts, not only Ghanaian scouts, but West African and European scouts and competing Ghanaian and also West African football clubs. And um, Red Bull wasn't really in, in a, didn't have a very good relation with those actors. And then there was the level of uh, the local communities, local authorities. So as I already said, there's not just the, the modern administration in Ghana, there's also traditional administration here. So when you're settling there and wanting to interact with um, institutions and with people, you don't just have to interact uh, with the mayors or um, the modern leaders, but also with the chiefs and traditional leaders. And then this is the third point. There is Red Bull, a transnational company with a completely difficult, uh, not difficult, but different uh, logic and with different aims. Um, um, they were not really embedded in the environment in Ghana and they were not interested at all in embedding there and interacting with uh, the people. They were interested in, in getting good players. For example, they also had this stadium with uh, for 1,000 uh, spectators, but it was never open um, to uh, local people when Red Bull Ghana played. And uh, to illustrate kind of slightly polemically the relations between Red Bull and, and the actors I just, just uh, mentioned, I want to show you these two pictures taken inside of the academy. At the left side you have the place um, where the Europeans lived and at the right side you have the place where the Ghanaians lived. So not talking about players but also about Ghanaian trainers. Um, you had uh, white trainers on living on the left side, you had black trainers living on the right side. And um, of course one could argue in a company there's kind of hierarchy and the management is living at another place than the workers, but the level of the trainers would have been the same. But still there was this kind of quite obvious difference. So to sum up, um, Red Bull just isolated from its surroundings to, to well, to reach their, their, um, their targets. And there have been some benefiting actors through the Academy of Red Bull, like individuals, like families, like some players, workers, definitely, and technical personnel. But there have also been a huge uh, amount of conflicts, like uncertainties and lack of tr transparency in land acquisition. For example, um, the, the land wasn't bought, it was, it was borrowed and Red Bull didn't pay, didn't have to pay for the land. But it was expected um, that there are some kind of um, social responsibilities that Red Bull has and therefore has to give something back to the community. But in, in, the, in the contracts, this was never, never defined. Another conflict has been, well, the isolation. I also mentioned, I already mentioned, uh, not only the ge geographical isolation, but also the institutional and um, the ignorance of local actors. So uh, there could never have been and there was no collective identification with the project. This was the project of Red Bull, but it was, was not uh, the academy or the team of the local people or of Ghanaians. Um, effects on the players. Um, one major pro problem for, for the locals has been that there were no local players. There was one statement of a Red Bull trainer who said that in the Volta region where the uh, academy is actually settled, you can't find good players but good fishers. And well, they just searched in the, in the northern region and outside of Ghana and not in the locality, uh, which was not very common to the interests of the local mayor and the local authorities. Um, there was also a high fluctuation among the players. So if they found a good player in a regional or inter-regional tournament, uh, a 
another they and they, they took that player or maybe ten players at that time. Other ten players had to leave the academy. So the, there was absolutely no um, um, security in contract, no security of stay, therefore no security concerning uh, education and no tertiary education at all. So there were no options to football. Um, on the one side, there was really a very high level of technical and tactical training, lots of commitment of the trainers, of the managers, also of the players. But on the other side, there was also a strong focus on, on, on discipline and on re-socialization. So um, it was the expelled aim of Red Bull, not officially, but in interviews, um, that the players are getting rid of their Ghanaian values and, and, and getting to know European values, okay, quite similar as we already heard today, because without those European values, it's not possible to to um, yeah to play European or to play football in European leagues. Well, um, after all, Red Bull uh, established a system that uh, was strength strengthening dream dreams of Europe among the players and the legion of facility. But as already stated, not really um, showing options, realistic options for the players. And there definitely are some potentials, or would have been some potential potentials in the local communities, among the players and the workers and employees, but um, to sum up or to conclude, I just want to say that uh, from my point of view, this, this model of European football academies in, in Western Africa, also in Southern Africa and other parts, is, is a failed model um, if they're not um, trying to equally involve local people, if they can't develop equal structures, if they can't ensure contract security as well as uh, proper education for the players, and if they can't show respect for um, the, the local realities. And now the clue is, as some or many of you already know, is that Red Bull Ghana closed its doors um, in 2013, according to Gerard Bouillet, um, the global head, uh, the, the head of global soccer of Red Bull, um, due to remote, to the remote area with no larger city nearby, no potential for fans, and because of mistakes of the local management. And in 2014, um, the academy or the infrastructure, infrastructure was taken over by Feyenoord Ghana, or Feyenoord Fete, um, calling the new academy West African Football Academy, um, supposedly in close technical and textual cooperation with Red Bull Ghana. And what I think, I don't know it, but from, um, um, from some interviews with local people, I heard that the structure is more or less the same. What they reached so far is that they transferred one player to the second league in Portugal. Thank you. I would like to invite all of the speakers up here. Uh, tonight. I think there are a lot of different aspects that you have been presenting that are interested, interesting to have here in a panel debate. Um, and while uh, you in the audience might have some questions, yeah, I'm going to start off with, out with one question, uh, and then I'll uh, leave, uh, let, it open, let the floor be open to, to, to all of you. Because I was wondering, we heard different things um, regarding securing these athletes, athletes operating in Europe from different parts of the world. We were talking about that it's, they are not naive when they go uh, to Europe to play football. Uh, they see an opportunity. But when we have very young players, and you were talking about the institution of having players become footballers that can move to Europe. When we have these young players who come to Europe and who may not be the best footballers and may not get a contract. 
Do you think there are people who have a responsibility to ensure that they get an education or get a job, that there's some form of security when we bring these players to Europe, for instance? Anyone who wants to comment? Uh, well, definitely some sort of a net, a social security net would be very beneficial for them. Um, uh, I mean, yeah, it's true. So many of them uh, fail in tests. Uh, so many of them uh, give up for one reason or the other. Uh, they end up in uh, maybe doing some menial jobs or um, um, they end up in, um, yeah, they end up in precarious places where they have no one or, yeah, often they have no one to rely upon. So, uh, yeah, definitely some, some net would be good for them. It would be beneficial. You want to contribute? Yeah. Yeah, but, uh, oh, and one of the points is that it may not be the European idea of education that may be the most relevant. Uh, I don't know, you didn't touch I really think it's interesting that the virtual academy, which has also been studied by Paul Darby, but as I understand it, it has been a very European idea about education. And bringing that to African youth in Africa is debatable as well, I think, because education is not just beneficial. Um, I don't know if Martin could comment mm -hmm. on that because I'm yeah. really interested in that. Yeah, uh, so yeah, at Red Bull there was a high school, a junior high school and a senior high school. Uh, with the, the younger players quite motivated to go to school, the older players not at all, because they, they already saw themselves at, as, as footballers. Um, and it was definitely a European um, way of education and also European thinking of education. Um, the problem for the Red Bull officials has been that the, the teachers were Ghanaians and they didn't understand how to teach um, in an European way. This is what the Red Bull officials said. And therefore, when I was there, um, uh, that was the time when there were some, um, some new ideas. And the idea of the officials was um, that they have to search for European teachers. And only then it can, can work out. And on the other side, the Ghanaian teachers who I interviewed as well had the problem that they, they were not allowed to, um, they said, punish um, um, the pupils because um, this kind of punishment is more or less uh, um, part of the traditional Ghanaian education system. And it didn't mean uh, physical punishment, but um, other sorts of punishment who he wasn't allowed to, to do because he didn't have the permission of, of the Red Bull officials. And well, of course, um, it didn't work at all. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I, I would just kind of uh, echo what what Martin said. Um, I mean, in in, in Senegal, it's, um, you have a very s a similar situation in in a lot of these academies um, that there's there's kind of um, there's an attempt to to you know present um, a kind kind of combination of football training and education, um, and I think in, in many cases, you know, this is kind of used to to acquire international partnerships or to get funding or to gain credibility and you know to, to you know to, and to kind of give uh, european clubs uh, a sense that they're somehow con you know investing in a social project um, but but in, but you know the, the the reality is kind of quite different the the, the players aren't very interested in in actually um, uh, well i mean they they're completely focused on on a professional career and uh, i mean the, the kind of the educational aspect is often um, sidelined who should go into this? Is it Fifth Pro who, who represent the players? Is it the clubs or maybe a third part? The EU, the no, neither Fifth Pro or EU, the EU representative is here right now who was left. Yeah, Sina. Well, that's why I would l have loved the EU yeah. sport unit to be here. Um, because I do think that writing a four, uh, 40 pages document about your career policy in the European countries without at all mentioning the um, scenario that there be what there's athletes coming from abroad into Europe um, is European blind in many sense. So I do think there's definitely things that and I, I don't 
it may not have been deliberately. I think, simply think that there are people there who haven't thought. So I, I encourage them, and I spoke to the EU Sports Union good morning uh, to take that into consideration. We have a question from Nico, who was actually presenting in the first session on, on transfer and trafficking. Yep. Uh, my question is to Martin uh, Kainz. Um, I, I, I'm, uh, of course, uh, uh, fully supportive of, uh, of a critical perspective on uh, the materials that we're seeing. However, um, I was a little bit, uh, uh, I find your presentation a little bit problematic uh, in the sense that um, you identify specifically what academy you are uh, you work, you, that you feel work in, and not only that, but it's an academy that is, support, that is supported, even though it's closed now, it was supported by a very powerful corporation. So uh, you, at best, you uh, raise, uh, it raises ethical questions. At worst, you could be in very serious legal trouble uh, against uh, a company against which you would have very little defense. Um, the, uh, I mean, the, the identifying like this a, uh, uh, a particular corporation, a particular, and, and the, 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 the academy that it's uh, funding uh, would probably not go past any ethical uh, review from the European Union in research. Um, and uh, uh, I mean, the danger, um, I hope that, I think that you should really think very seriously when, before publishing this, um, uh, the danger, but even sort of presenting it is already, you know, uh, putting yourself uh, on the line um, uh, or presenting it orally. The danger that you also run is that uh, um, if uh, um, academies get wind of, of the way in which you present things, okay? And uh, again, I'm completely supportive of, being of, of the critical stance that you're taking. But if, uh, if, if uh, um, uh, academies get wind of the fact that you are actually identifying the academies, an, an academy in your work, then researchers behind you will never be, have access to this academy. They will tell, you know, the academies, understandably, will say, go to hell. Martin, you want to ask it? Yeah, uh, thanks for that comment, and, and yeah, y you are right. I also thought about the legal issues quite uh, intensively and for a long time, and I was for a long time thinking about even maybe not showing pictures of the academy and also thinking about the way I'm presenting it. Um, I showed, so um, my, my data is already published with the, in a book and also in an article and both things were sent to Red Bull from my site and it was okay for them. So they just didn't respond, they didn't sue me. Um, they got the material and they knew that I was there for, um, for researching for my master thesis and already master theses are some kind of uh, publications. They are open to everybody. And therefore, well, I also showed the whole data and the things I've written um, to a lawyer and so far I had no problems with that. And about other researchers, um, thank you for this comment. I have definitely to think about that. Are there any more questions? Yeah, Juliana. Yeah, she'll, you'll just get the microphone. Um, I, I appreciated the... Could you the please uh, state your name and where you, which, who you represent? Oh, yeah. sorry. My name is Juliana Barbasa. I'm a journalist. And I uh, appreciated the, the presentation by uh, Mark and Eros uh, of uh, young players as agents, obviously not passive victims of, of what's being done to them, and, and their approach to this, the, this complex decision to, to migrate for football. But I, as, as, as active and intelligent people in their lives, I'm sure they also appreciate the fact that they're entering a, a, a hugely uneven um, playing field with a very uneven power dynamic, uh, a, a system in which they're, they're very vulnerable to, to exploitation. In, in the earlier session, we, we talked about um, some options for addressing the, the transfer system, we, uh, the field in which they're about to enter. I, I wonder if in, in these conversations they have with their friends, 
um, if in their acquisition of knowledge about this world that they're about to enter to or seeking to enter into, if they themselves have ideas or, or hopes or thoughts about what would um, improve their, uh, their conditions, if uh, we, we talked about a, a support network, um, do they talk about these risks and do they have ideas of what they would like to see happen um, to protect them as they, they engage in this? Uh, yeah. I have a thought. You um, can both answer yeah. just one at a time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, uh, thank you for the question. I think it's um, um, uh, one, one thing I found kind of in all these conversations is that um, um, these, these football players are very aware that, um, I mean, that they're taking a risk. They're also very aware of the fact that, uh, you know, statistically that their chances of success is, are very small. So, you, so every football player, you know, has some kind of figure they can give you, oh, you know, one in, one in 25, one in 100, one in 1,000. You know, they, they all have some kind of, uh, Id, you know, idea of, uh, you know, how, how m kind of small the, the chances of making it are. But in, in fact, um, no, no one who I spoke to um, um, kind of, you know, no one sees themselves as a person who needs protecting in any way because, I mean, for them, you know, they're, they're kind of seizing their, their chance, their... They're working towards their future. They don't see themselves uh, at this stage. They don't see themselves at all as you know vulnerable, um, um, you know vulnerable people who need who need protection from from so, you know they they see themselves as you know adventurers perhaps or as kind of young men who are who are you know working towards their future. No, I mean and and of course I mean that that possibly has has to do with the fact that they're. They only see the system, you know, from from one end, and they only hear about what happens in Europe from, um, you know, from, you know, through through a filter, of course. Um, so I mean, that that's de I mean, it would definitely be be a very interesting question to ask those young players who have um, who have migrated to Europe, and I think that's going to be a second phase of our research. Yeah, uh, it's th thanks for that question. Uh, it's definitely true that they don't uh, feel like uh, they need a sort of a protection, but they actually do have uh, protect. I mean, they use protection from their uh, personal contacts, from their families, from their families abroad and fr families back home. So in that way, they create the, their own social networks. But um, uh, in terms of uh, how uh, this um, uh, unequal, how, how this, this balanced position can be changed, uh, generally they speak about uh, development of football in Africa. So they speak about that th uh, there should be more money invested in uh, football fields, uh, in uh, development of players, uh, in, devel in uh, new equipment. So uh, um, they see, so basically they see uh, on TV, on, on television, through media, through internet, Facebook and so on, they see very good conditions abroad. Uh, they see that uh, in, in their eyes the, the kids in Europe have much better chances of uh, making a career uh, in football and in other things as well. Uh, so they are aware that they are in a position uh, that is not beneficial to them. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, one of the solutions that they, that they say is just uh, more, uh, more investment. More money should be invested in stadiums, in equipment, in coaches. Um, so uh, yeah, that's that's their idea. Yeah. Well, I also wanted to follow on complimenting Uwas and Mark for some very interesting and embedded description, tip description. Um, I think there's something more to be done about the role as the entrepreneur, because you leave it now to say that it's not trafficking, but we are rather perhaps talking about entrepreneurs, and James Essen has written about that. But there's a lot, both in the anthropological literature and the sociological literature, about the role of the uh, um, and the ambiguity of being an entrepreneur that I think could be interesting to be spelled out. Uh, any questions now? Yep, we have one there. Hello? Yep, it's ready. <laughs> My name is Eileen, I'm from Heidelberg in Germany. Uh, my question is to Martin. Um, I was actually wondering, um, do you have any information why the um, Red Bull Ghana 
academy was based in that r rural area. Um, and another question is, um, do you have any information on the, or did you follow up on the um, new academy that was opened up in uh, 2014, whether there is um, a participation of uh, local people, local youth for now? Thank you. Okay, thank you for the two questions. Um, Red Bull settled there because um, in advance there has already been a small, small academy, Austrian academy, at the same place called Soccer, Cooler, uh, Soccer School of Lavantal. Lavantal is an area in, in Austria. And um, Red Bull got to know uh, the owner of of uh, this academy, also uh, um, the, the Austrian ambassador in Ghana, who is also the distributor of the Red Bull can, and therefore the connections yeah, came and, and it was not too, too difficult for Red Bull to settle there. And of, of course the, the local set had a strong interest in Red Bull settling in the area. And the other question, the from the new academy, the WAFA, um, West African Football Academy. I don't, I just know from, from two people from the locality. Um, the one is, is uh, quite near to the chief from Fivier. He said that they tra tried several times to speak to them, but, but couldn't, but this is more or less the only thing I know. And therefore I can't say if there is more interaction right now. Um, but it is the same structure as as, as Feyenoord Fette. So, um, in 1999, Feyenoord Rotterdam expanded to Ghana and and built Feyenoord Fette, and it was sold to private investors in 2010, but still having the same um, general manager. And so this personnel went from Fette to Sogakope, where the new academy is right now, and took the players from Fette to Sogakope. And the sports director, for example, is Sam Ajay. He is quite a popular um, Ghanaian uh, football trainer. And therefore, I think at least um, in the experts uh, and in the, in the management area, there is more or less um, like Europeans as well as, as Ghanaians. But I'm not too good informed. I think I would raise a question here. Um, when, as uh, it's actually touching upon something Nico brought up about the social uh, relations, like having a family, even if it's biologi biological or not. But um, I saw at mo some time uh, uh, a uh, Brazilian documentary on football players, which is a similar case like the ones we, one we see in, in African football, that when you come to Europe to play, you are very much socially isolated because they help with the technical aspects, the training, they give you a home, but there's no social network. You touched upon it uh, in, in, in regard to, to rugby. Is there a lack of social responsibility, like securing there's a network around these players when they come to Europe or to, to other clubs? I mean, I, I can kind of answer f for, the, for the case of Senegalese players. Um, and I mean, it depends very much on where they end up. Um, the primary destination of Senegalese players is, um, is, uh, te tends to be France um, or Belgium um, and Italy. And these are countries where there are very strong, um, very well-established networks of Senegalese people. So, um, you know, it's uh, a, a Senegalese player moving to, to France or Italy is um, is guaranteed is actually guaranteed to have uh, to have contacts, um, you know, be they kind of direct family contacts or um, you know through friends or through acquaintances, um, and I mean these these networks in these countries, the Senegalese communities in these countries, are extremely active, um, and in fact this applies to to migration in general, not only to football players. Um, and, and what what you also see is that um, you know certain clubs. Uh, who recruit Senegalese players tend to, to recruit uh, not just one, but several, and they have these kind of partnerships or these links with uh, academies. So in, um, in especially when we're talking about the younger players, um, you'll often see you know, five or six Senegalese players in one 
uh, in one French club, for example. But of course, it's a very different story, I think, if you look um, to e places like Eastern Europe or the Middle East, for example. I mean, I, I can only answer on, on what I've met related to women's football and um, in Scandinavian clubs. And, and, and the issue is that I do think that the clubs intend to be socially responsible. Um, but they are living very different lives and um, um, imaginations about Africans up to the level that Kirsten describes. So they would be regularly meeting quite racialized uh, s statements and expectations and so forth when coming to Scandinavian clubs. And they, they live isolated lives, lives, among others, due to the fact that the other players would be occupied with a life outside of sport, with having an education or something else. But what their answer to that is very often because in, in remote cities they would not be able to link up with diaspora communities. Sometimes they, they worship online, they use uh, social media very much. There's a study to be done there. Uh, quite interesting. Some of them keep the, the time, the sense of time related to, to African or the specific country they come from time and uh, online daily. Sorry, that's actually a good bridge to the last question I just wanted to, to give. You talk about this uh, self-charismatization uh, uh, that you just mentioned again. Uh, sh should we try to work against this or is it part of their identity that they want to keep? I think it it will be very hard actually to to work against that because it's shared from many sides. It's coaches, it's fans, it's the football industry, it's the media, and it's players themselves. So who would be the actor to to work against that? Maybe academics. I don't know. But, <laughs> but uh, as anthropologists, we actually we don't involve in that. No, but actually, uh, it's. I thought about that that if I would have a policy recommendation what to do, actually I don't have because everybody seems to be happy but my task is to raise the, the issue and raise the and show that there is a problem and if that continues actually we will never overcome our world view about Africa and that, that's actually a big problem and uh, I don't have a solution to that. Sorry. Okay, I think we'll finish up with that and give the panel a round of applause. Thank you for listening and for coming to this session. I think we got a lot of interesting issues on the table here. Thank you.